Okay. So I believe this is recording the session. Um, uh, I wanted to do an overview of some of the topics in Chapter 8. And I'm not going to screen share because I've had some issues with that getting bumped out. But what I'm going to do is look at the content in the online course. So if you go to your content and you go to uh, Lesson 8.1, which is in Module 8, Designing Classes. I'm going to start and talk a little bit about Lesson 8.1, and I will kind of go through some of the lessons explaining the concepts, and then I'll talk about some of the things I have here on the, uh, the screen. So some of Chapter 8 should be a review, because we've been working with classes for a while now, either classes that are in the Java library or API, like Rectangle, or classes that we've written ourselves. So we've got some familiarity with the idea of a class. And so in Lesson 8.1, they're telling you that a class represents a single concept. It has a common purpose. It has methods. It has data. It has what we call state and behavior. So methods are behavior. Data or instance variables are state. And it usually is a unit that completes a purpose, OK? And so an example of this would be student, where we're going to have instance variables like name and GPA and date of birth, and we're going to have methods like calc, GPA, get name, change, or set name, things like that. We're going to have a constructor. So that is what I call kind of a generic class. That is my term for it. That's not necessarily Java's term. But that's what we've been working with, these traditional classes that is, they, these are the types of classes you code maybe 90% of the time uh, if you're working in a Java programming environment for a job, say. And of course, class names generally are nouns. Um, and they think in Lesson 8.1, they say don't use verbs like throwing, for example, uh, for a class name. They're generally nouns, like maybe baseball player or uh, something like that. But Keep that in mind. It tends to be a noun. Um, and then they give you the, the basic parts of a class. So they're diagramming or dissecting a class for you. So we have you know public class, my class name, then we have our uh, curly brace. And usually at the top, which you're used to, we have our variables, so our instance variables. They can go at the top or the bottom, actually. Uh, most people tend to put them at the top. Then we have our constructor, one or more constructors. Then we have our methods. And again, this is stuff you're very used to. Um, and we call that the class declaration. The body are the lines of code in between the opening curly brace and the closing curly brace. And we can create objects. We can instantiate or create objects using constructors. Uh, we can have mutator methods, accessor methods, and so on. So that is what you're used to. Now, they, they introduce the concept very high level of a different type of class called a utility class, or better known as a static class. OK, got bumped out there for a minute. So we're dealing with a static class, which we also call a utility class, because it tends to be a class that provides some type of functionality, um, not so much a class that is uh, you know, creating instance variables and tracking information and performing actions on that information. A, a utility class tends to be something like, for example, the math class in Java. We need a way to do square roots and powers and tangents and sines and cosines. That's utility function. That's something we need to be able to do. We're not really tracking information about tangent or sine or square root. But we need to be able to do them. So when we deal with a static class, we're never going to create an object of that class. We're never going to say class name XYZ equals new constructor name. We're going to use instead 
the name of the class dot method name, which is why if you remember with the math class, it was math dot sqrt, and in parentheses you passed it the number you wanted the square root of. Math dot pal, math dot min, math dot max, and so on. So when you're dealing with static, static is not, don't think of static as you're going to be dealing with an object. You, are, you needed a way, when you create a static class, you need a way to put some type of functionality that's not really specific to uh, maybe a certain person or thing. You need just a generic way to put a whole bunch of methods together that do some type of functions, like the math class, and you make it static. Because it wouldn't really make sense that every time you wanted to do a square root, you would have to do math, my math, equals new math, paren paren, and then, you know, my math dot sqrt. That doesn't make sense. We need to just be able to do square roots without having to go to the overhead of allocating memory to create objects when we're not really tracking anything about square root. We're just trying to do a calculation. As opposed to, say, a student where we, we need, for each student, we need variables. We need to allocate memory to get their name, their GPA stored, et cetera. So that's kind of where static is is a little different than a class of like we've been doing. So that gives you the idea of a static class. And they touch on that a little bit in lesson 8.1. Oh, and I'm just looking at that really quickly. Another thing they point out is you'll see the term actor. Some classes are called actors because they do work for you. So scanner is an actor. It does some type of action for you. They generally end in ER or OR. Um, all right. So I'm going to come back later, maybe in another lecture, and talk about cohesion and coupling and all of that, I want to dwell a little bit longer on the idea of static, which is lesson 8.6 and 8.7. So we can have a static class, such as the whole math class is a static class. We can also have a static method. Now, I found a really good definition online. A static method belongs to the class not to an object, not to an instance of the class. It belongs to the class. Static methods don't use instance variables. You're generally passing a parameter to them. It's doing some type of action or manipulation of the parameter you passed in, and then it's returning a result. And this is a good point. I never really thought to tell you all this. We talk about instance variables, you know, private string student name is an instance variable in the student class, for example. We call it an instance variable. Well, the methods that operate on that name, such as get name and set name, we refer to those as instance methods. You know, public, void, set name. That is an instance method. It doesn't have the word static in it, so it's an instance method. And it operates on an instance variable. So that's a good thing to keep in mind. Instance methods, which are the ones you're used to writing, work on instance variables. Static, which you're learning about, does not use those instance variables. It'll be in the class file, but it's not going to use any of the instance variables. And so I think in one of the FRQs that we did, and I can't remember which one, but it had you write static methods, and one of the main issues with or things that you do with a static method is you use the word static when you declare the method. That clues Java in that anything in that method is going to apply to the class as a whole. So static methods are really good for things like accumulating totals for all the objects that you might create of that class type in a program. So if I want to create 100 students, and I want to keep track of the average GPA for all 100 students. So that means I want one GPA. I want to take everybody's GPA, add it up, divide that number by 100. That is the average GPA for all of the students that I've created in my Java program when it's running. 
I cannot do that without using a static method, because if I have average GPA as an instance method, just public uh, void calc GPA or public double calc GPA if I'm going to return a value, if I make that an instance method without using the word static, what's going to happen is it's only going to calculate the average GPA for, e for that one person. So when I create student1 and I say student1.calc average GPA, that's going to take student1's GPA and divide it by 1. I'm going to get student1's GPA. And then when I add student2 and I create that student and I put their GPA information in and I say, do I say student1.calc average GPA or do I say student2.calc average GPA? If that's an instance method, no matter how I call it, it's, it's only going to take that particular student's GPA, divide it by 1, and give you their GPA back. So if I want to take all 100 students that I've created, add all their GPAs up and divide by 100, the only way I can do that is to create a static method within my student class. And Java will understand that I'm telling it to accumulate the values across all of the objects. And let me, let me keep a running total of everybody's GPA. And then maybe when I'm at some point, I, I'm keeping also the total number of students I have. And then at some point, I'm going to call that method. It's going to add all the GPAs up, divide by the total number of students, and it's going to give me back the true average. So static methods are used a lot for things like accumulating a value for all the objects you've created or keeping account of the total number of objects that you've created. So maybe I want to keep track of how many bank accounts were open today. Well, if I make a static method and every time a new person opens a bank account, I have a little, you know, counter equals counter plus one statement inside that method. At the end of the day, when I say, hey, go to my static method and print out the total that the value that's in that counter, print it out for me. And I have a way to do that. I'm going to get back that I created 10 accounts or 20 accounts and so on. So the concept of static is static belongs to the class. It's generally very easy to use them as accumulators or counters across every object that's created for the class when your program runs. And it's the only way that I know of to keep running totals. Now you can also have, and I'll do an example of that in a minute, I also want to talk about really quickly, you can have a static variable, and there's some good examples online. So here's public class stuff, and I might have instance variables in here, instance methods in here, a constructor in here. But I can also declare a variable that is static, and I can initialize it when I declare it, public static string. So I'm just inserting the word static between public and string. Here's what I'm calling it, name, and I'm setting it to a value. When I want to use that, say I have in my Java program, I've cr created 20 stuff objects, stuff one, stuff two, stuff three. If I want to use that static variable for every single instance, every single object, I can do that. I can put stuff, notice it's the class name dot that public static variable name, and you're going to need to make these public in order to use them in main. Remember, instance variables are private, and we use getters and setters to manipulate them. When you start dealing with a static variable that goes across every object that every object wants to use in that class, you've got to make it public so that in main, you can just put class name dot variable name, and this would print out I'm a static variable. So you'll see static use for things like maybe I've got a class of called credit card, and I have uh, an APR, and everybody's going to get the same APR, say it's going to be 5%. I might make that static. So public static double interest equals 0.05. And then I can use that. I don't, I have that across every object that I've created. So when it comes to memory allocation, instead of me making that a private instance variable, 
interest rate is 5% and it's 5% for everybody. If I make it a private instance variable and I create 100 credit card accounts, I've eaten up 100 units of memory to hold 0.05 even though it's the same for every single person. So I've eaten up a lot of memory to hold the same value 100 times. If I know I'm going to make the APR the same for everybody, if I make it static, I've eaten up only one memory unit. I can't remember how many bytes that is for a double. I've only eaten up one memory location. I'm only storing 0.05 one place in memory instead of 100 times. So it's a lot more efficient for memory. Some people will use it for things like pi or for other values. The other nice thing is, you know, I can just go in and, and change it, and I've, I've updated, if I change it from 5 to 6%, again, I've only, I've only got to change it one place in memory. I don't have the program going, oh, now I've got to go to 100 different memory locations and change it from 5 to 6%. So a static variable is useful for something that's going to be the same for everybody, every object you're creating of that type. It's more memory efficient if you're going to have the same value for everybody. Um, and you reference it again, class name, dot variable name, and it must be public in order to be accessible in main. If you make it private, you're not going to be able to do stuff dot name. You're going to get a compile error. So I'm going to stop for a minute before I go more into static methods and just see if you have any questions. So we're going from this idea of creating classes with instance variables and methods and constructors where we create or instantiate objects, multiple objects, right? So if I have a student where I have three variables for each student and I create 100 students, I've created, what, 300 variables, 100 times 3. I've used up that much memory. With static, if I create a static variable, I'm creating one copy of that variable that all 100 students would share. If I create a static method, I'm creating a method that I can use to accumulate values over all of the 100 objects that I've created, for example. So do you kind of see the difference there? Any questions on that? Okay, you will definitely see static on the AP exam. So it's really important that you, one, remember when you, if you think you're confused about static, always think math class. Remember how it's math dot whatever the uh, method name is, okay? It's a utility class. It does the heavy lifting for you. So you don't have to create an instance of an object in order to get a square root. You can just do math dot square root. It's used to accumulate values. It's, it's used, the variables are used to help with memory allocation to minimize that. All right, let me find a good example here to put up of a static method. Give me one second. The Java tutorial actually has a good section on static. So one thing I want to point out, I showed you a static variable, meaning that it is a class variable. It's the same value for every object of the class that you create, but it can be changed. It is a variable. So you can have a static variable that's changeable. Um, you can also remember that we can declare constants. Now some people will make pi a static variable, some people will make it a constant. Um, it's probably better as a constant. But remember the word static is also used when you're declaring an unchangeable value like pi. So when I write a program and I use static final double, I'm making that constant, meaning I can never change it as the program runs. But if I do a static variable, like I did in that last example, I can change the value of that. So in their example here, they've got a class, they've got their private instance variables. Now in this case, they made their static variable private, which if I think about it, if you're not going to use it in main, you can make it private. If you wanted to be able to print out number of bicycles by doing bicycle dot number of bicycles in main, you'd need to make this public static. 
But the way they've set theirs up, they decided to keep it private. So you can do that. Don't always see the private with static. A lot of times you see it as a public static variable. So here they've started out with the number of bicycles being zero. And every time they create a bicycle object, they're going to bump up the number of bicycles by one. So here's their typical constructor where they pass in some values. Don't get too hung up on the plus plus being in front of the variable. The plus plus is a, like a pre-incrementer. You are not responsible for those on the AP exam. So what it does is it actually um, adds one, I think, to the number of bicycles, and then it assigns the ID number versus assigning the ID number and then incrementing it. You don't have to get caught up in that. I just want you to understand that in the constructor, they're taking that number of bicycles, and every time a bicycle is created, they're adding one to it. So that means that when they want to check the number of bicycles, when they want to check the number of bicycles, they're storing the number of bicycles also in their ID number. The first bicycle they created is one, the second is two, the third is three. So when they get their ID number, that tells them the number of bicycles created. It's going to always return the, the last number stored in uh, ID, which is the, you know, if it's the 10th bicycle, number of bicycles gets the number 10 in it, which is also the last ID number assigned. So because they're using a getter method, they kept the variable private. I would have made it public, and then in main, I would just be going bicycle, you know, system that out that print line bicycle dot, and I would be using number of bicycles. Um, so again, it keeps a running total across all the objects that are created. So at the end of the day, I know how many bicycles were built or sold, whatever's going on with this example. Now. They also have, so this is sort of a getter method to get the ID, which is based on the number of bicycles. ID is technically an instance variable, not a static. So then they also give another example. So using that same bicycle analogy, and again, I would have made that variable public, and I would have done it a little different. They decided to ah, keep that a private static. So they created their own getter for the static variable. And notice the, the difference between what you're used to doing and a static method is just after the word public, you put the word static. So public static, and then you're, you're used to doing int or double, whatever, and then the name. So that's the pattern they followed, public static int, get number of bicycles. And they're going to return that static variable's value back. So you can tell at the end of the day how many bicycles were built or sold, whichever one it is. So We've come from the concept of using the word static for a constant, like pi, to being able to use the word static for a variable that we probably, most of the time, are going to be using to accumulate a value across all of the objects that we've created, to using static for a method, which again is generally, you know, to calculate something across all the objects we've created, or to return a static variable. And I think in the FRQ that we did, it was, I think we were, what were we doing, multiple arrays or uh, collections of numbers, and we were trying to get like sums or averages or something like that across potentially all of the objects created. So that's why the methods were static. Um, I'm going to hold off on static classes for right now. You just need to kind of think about constants using the word static static variables and static methods at this point.
All right, any questions on that? Now, you can technically, you technically can say, uh, you know, say I had a static variable, you know, average GPA, and I've got 100 students. In theory, you can do student one dot average GPA, and it will give you back the average GPA for all 100 students, even though you're referencing it as student one dot or student two dot or student 99 dot. Don't do that. The compiler will let you do that, but when somebody's looking at your code, it's not clear that it's a static variable. It looks like an instance variable, okay? Especially if you do like they did and reference it through like a, a method. So whenever you're doing, dealing with static variables, use class name dot static variable name. Even though you could do object name dot, don't do that. That's confusing and it's really frowned upon. Okay, so that covers a lot about static. So if I'm looking at the content of the course, make sure when you're looking at some of these lessons online, if you'll notice, for example, in lesson 8.6, static methods is underlined because it's a hyperlink. And if you click on static methods, it takes you to the Oracle site that talks about static. So make sure that you're, you know, you're clicking on some of these hyperlinks because they do take you to good references outside the course that will help you understand a little better some of the concepts. Oh, the other thing I wanted to point out, if you've ever wondered why the default class that you create in Java that we call main, it's like public static void main, right? Why is it static? Well, now it should maybe be coming to you that the reason main is static is that we need to be able to run main's code without creating an object, right? We don't want to have to create an object of type main. We need a class that lets us just run it and come in and not worry about a constructor and creating an instance and all of that. So that is why main is static. It gives us a place where we can always run code without worrying about having to create an object before we even get started. So that's the reason that uh, main is actually static. So we don't have to create an, an object of type main. Some of the other topics in chapter eight include precondition and postcondition, which is in lesson 8.5. Now, I talked a little bit in some of the recordings I did on the FRQs, that when you see code that the AP exam has, and above a method, they're asking you to look at a method and write something in an FRQ. And they'll have preconditions and postconditions in the comments above the method header that they want you to write, or sometimes it's in the code that they want you to read before you do anything. So preconditions and postconditions tell you important information about the method that you're dealing with. A precondition tells you everything that you can assume to be true before the method executes. For example, in hidden word, a precondition might be the length of the guess and the length of the word will always be the same. The methods won't be called or used unless that condition is true. So what that means to you is, I don't have to write code to check and see if the guess and the, length, the, the secret word are the same length. I don't have to worry about it. Because the precondition says this method will never be called unless that case is true. So that would save you time. So be sure to pay attention to any preconditions they give you on the FRQs, because it's telling you what you can assume 
to be true before that method is called, meaning you don't have to code for it. Like another precondition was the word is always in uppercase. So you don't have to code for uppercase, lowercase on the secret word or the guess because the precondition is telling you assume that any guess coming in is in uppercase and so is the uh, secret word. Now a post condition tells you everything that must be true when the method finish execute, finishes executing. So that can help you on an FRQ as well. Because if you're not clear on exactly what you need to do for a method, and you look at the comments that tell you the post condition is when this method finishes executing, it will return an integer back to main that will be printed out. You better make sure that at the end of that method, the last line of code that's going to execute is a return of an integer. And if it tells you in the post condition you're returning an integer, but the print system.out.println print line part will happen in main, don't put system.out.println in your method. So you've got to pay attention to the post conditions. Or it might tell you the post condition is that some variable will be incremented appropriately. So that clues you in that, hey, there's some variable in this thing that I better make sure is getting, you know, one added to it or some number added to it. So pay attention to those pre and post conditions on the FRQs in particular. All right, so that was precondition and post condition. That's important. Static methods we talked about. Now in Lesson 8.8, it talks about the idea of scope, which hopefully, I know I've talked about that in other lectures, and hopefully you're, you're understanding that because you've been using scope now for a long time. Scope is how or where is a method or variable visible? Where can a method or variable be used? Now, we make all of our instance variables private, so there's scope is private. The two scopes are private and public. Private instance variables can only be directly manipulated with lines of code like name equals whatever in the class. You cannot go into main and say student1.name equals Smith. You have to do student1.setName Smith and then the uh, acts of the mutator method in the class will actually have a line of code in it, you know, this dot name equals name, and it will set the instance variable name equal to Smith. Public means that we can use that method or variable, if you have like a public static variable, we can reference it not only within code within the class file, but we can also directly reference it in main or any other class that wants to use it. So if I had a public static variable, like number of bicycles, if I made that public static, then in main I can say bicycle dot number of bicycles. I can put that in a print line statement. I don't have to use a get method or anything like that. So we obviously want to make probably 99% of our methods public so they can be used in main. We're probably going to make 99% of our classes public. Because if I have a private class, it really doesn't do me any good. I can't use it anywhere, at least based on what we know now. I'm going to make 99% of my instance variables private so that I can't accidentally let somebody manipulate them in main, that I keep their manipulation and their state very controlled within my class file. So in the lesson online, they tell you for scope in lesson 8.8 8, um, that non-constant fields, which are pretty much our instance variables, should be private, which is what we've been doing. I think static variables, depending on what you're doing, can go either way, public or private. And if we're doing a constant like pi, we're pretty much going to make that public. 
because we want that to be usable, because it's generally going to be static, and we want it to be usable in main for all objects. So we're going to make that public. Most of our methods are going to be public, and our instance variables are going to be private. OK, so let me look at what else is in Chapter 8. We talked about static, scope, precondition, postcondition. We talked about choosing classes in Lesson 8.1. There's a little bit in Lesson 8.3 on accessors, mutators. Again, these are things you're familiar with that we call them getters and setters, accessors and mutators. There's a little blurb on immutable classes. Now, that tends to confuse people because immutable means unchangeable. And we say that strings are immutable. But we all know that you can reset a string. You can change the value of a string. So what exactly do we mean by that? What we mean by that is, yes, we can change the value. Let me see if I can get the white board here to cooperate. We can, in fact, change the value. But we do that by reassigning it. So I've taken name, I've given it the value of Smith. And we saw in one of our examples, then I've reassigned it by saying name equals Jones. So we saw in one of our uh, examples that if I put this in a print line statement, if I put that in a print line statement, it would definitely print out Jones in all caps. But what we realized is that it did not actually change the value in the variable name. It did not change or update that memory location. It still has capital J, little o, n, e, s. So we didn't change it by invoking a method on it. On other things, we can change the value by invoking a method. But on an immutable object, we can't do that. We have to reassign the value. If you remember with that Mississippi string exercise we did, if you did, if you put, you know, Mississippi with the dot replaced in a print line, it would print out correctly, but you had not actually changed the value. So if I really want name to have uppercase Jones in it, I've got to do something like this to reassign it. Or I have to just basically do this one of the two, but I've reassigned it. I cannot just change the value by invoking a method call on it. Even if that method call seems to be manipulating it, yes, it's manipulating it, but it's not updating the memory location. So that's what we mean by the whole idea of it being immutable. We've already talked about accessors and mutators throughout the whole course. Um, I think the last thing left was cohesion and coupling. And the definitions, I think, that are provided in the material are a little confusing. So let me see if I can find something a little better. It's a little clearer here, because one is good and one is not. <laughs> 
So one definition of cohesion is cohesion is the degree to which components of a class, instance variables, methods, etc., belong together, work together to fulfill a particular role. So we want high cohesion. So we want to make sure that when we create a class, everything that's in it specifically relates to the concept that we're trying to embody. So when we have a student class, we want to make sure that any instance variables or methods in that class are very specific to students. We don't want to accidentally put in there instance variables or methods that relate to another concept like teacher, necessarily. We want to make sure that we are not trying to put too much. We're not trying to make the class too broad. Classes tend to be very specific. So we don't want to try to create a class that's going to handle teachers and students. We need to break that out into two different classes, one for students and one for teachers, because they have very different actions. They have very different instance variables. So you really want high cohesion. That makes it easier to maintain. That makes it a lot more usable. Um, if you try to put too much stuff in a class and make it too broad, you're going to have a maintenance nightmare, and it's really just not going to be usable. It's not going to be user friendly. Um, coupling is the bad thing. Cohesion is good. Coupling is bad. So we want low coupling whenever we're creating classes and trying to create an application. And coupling is one class that is related to, tied to, another class. And the problem with that is if I have two classes that, that one class sort of creates an instance of another class within it, if I have two classes A and B, and A actually creates uh, an object of type B within its own class, if I have to change something in B, I am potentially breaking A. So if I'm using class A to call class B and create a method of type B within A, and I'm using some type of a method from class B in A, and that method returns an int, and somebody goes into class B and changes that method to return a double, I have now broken class A because class A was set up to expect an int to come back from that method call. Now a double's coming back. Or actually a better example would be a double was coming back, now an int's coming back, I've lost precision, there's going to be a problem. Or a method gets changed from a void method to returning an int. Now I've broken class A because it's hooked, it's tied to a little too much to class B. So you have to be very careful about that. Coupling can cause it to be a maintenance nightmare. You can break one class by making changes to the other, which is what I'm talking about with maintenance nightmare. Um, and it just makes it, again, those classes become not as usable. Um, so keep in mind, coupling is bad. We want low coupling. We want high cohesion, cohesion meaning we're very thoughtful when we create a class and we only put stuff in that class that pertains to the specific type of object we're creating. We don't create classes that are trying to do too many things or cover too many things, like, you know, having a person 